All right, so the, the more astute of you will have picked up that there is a, uh, new, uh, an alpha, alphanumeric code involved in, in SIGRE, and we've heard from the A's and the B's. We're now going to uh, change gears and jump to what the first of our C panels for uh, our presentation. So I'm going to call uh, Graham Ansell up to talk about what's going on in C1. Graham. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm Graham Ansell. Um, I'm the convener for the uh, Mirror Panel AUC1. I'm also a member of the International Study Committee for C1, and I've been doing this for about six years. Um, in that time, I've um, just provided a bit of context. I've um, led a couple of um, working groups, and I'm also a co-editor of the um, upcoming Green Book on Asset Management. Oops, where, there we go. Anyway, so Power System Development and Economics. That's the um, name of the group. And the, our study committee scope is probably not too bad. I've seen more convoluted ones come out of other study committees, but it's all probably, a, you know, sort of, um, it's a little bit vague and it has to have everybody's um, opinion as to what it is. And you sort of combine them together and you've got a um, sort of a, um, what's, what's the saying? A camel was a horse um, designed by a subcommittee. C1 has a number of activities. Um, so there's the traditional planning. Um, which is sort of looking at your capability of your network. We're figuring out how long the network's going to meet the demand on it until you're running into constraints. Um, then working out what your long-term grid plans are for across your network and so on. And um, interestingly, demand forecasting comes in here and um, the Australian um, CGRE, um, C1 panel had quite a lot of input into the uh, recent working group on... Um, demand um, forecasting, and I'll talk a bit about that later. Um, you've got asset management. Now, most of the um, you know, sort of equipment-based um, sort of um, C-grade groups will have look at the asset management issues specifically in relation to their assets. What the um, C1 looks at is the asset management more as a system or systemic appro or sy systematic approach to asset management. So we're looking at more, you know, sort of how are people dealing with the... Um, asset management standards like CAS 55 and ISO 55000. Um, we've also got a current working group going on looking at the monetization of risk within asset management so you can start comparing your expenditures. Um, <coughs> so, um, there's also a business management, and this is getting down more to the economic side of um, 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 C1. This is around sort of looking at things like um, how do you develop business cases for specific investments, um, you know, what are the drivers for transmission, um, you know, how are they changing, in, you know, in the light of emerging new technologies and developments. And there's also another um, work stream around interconnections, both horizontal and vertical. So it's not just looking at sort of one company's sort of network and um, working out what you do in that, it's saying, well, if you want to connect to other companies sort of, you know, horizontally, which is, you know, maybe in other countries or, you know, you know, quite in, or operating under quite different market conditions or no market at all sort of thing. We're also looking at the transmission to distribution. You know, how, how's power being exchanged between the two ones? So the, um, this one's sort of looking at, you know, some of the economics around, um, you know, you've got two different jurisdictions, you've got two markets that operate in different ways. How do you actually make the thing work and earn, earn some money off it? And this is quite relevant in terms of what I, to Australia and, um, in terms of the um, best link cables, you've got connections there. They're operating in you know, quite different island, you know, island of um, the power system. How do they actually work in real life and what commercial arrangements do you need around them um, to um, make sure they all work properly? Um, C1 study committee had its meeting in Chengdu um, in China. For a while I was a bit worried I wasn't only going to be able to get to Chengdu because um, I booked my transit airport as Hong Kong airport and about a week before the protesters managed to shut it down and uh, so I was a little bit worried about getting there but managed to get there in the end. Chengdu's um, really, um, it's, a, it's an interesting city, it's got about 10 million people or so um, and it's got the, what is it, the world's largest panda reserve so everyone likes their pandas there and it's also got some of the spiciest food I've ever met. Right, so 
One, these are the preference subjects or the preferential subjects for the um, Chengdu Symposium. Um, it's, and you can probably notice from this, this has got oh, this future sustainable, a sustainable future, and a future sustainable. So that was one of the key themes. Yeah. So everybody was really quite interested in that, and um, you know, sort of, it's and really what I think it's being driven by is more and more countries are adopting decarbonisation strategies, and everyone's trying to figure out what it actually means for them. Um, right. Okay. The <clears throat> one of the key themes that came out of the um, symposium was around the Internet of Things and its implications for electricity. The Internet of Things um, sort of envisages a, a network of smart um, communicating devices that work together to provide some benefits. And what that sort of the applications you have um, in electricity is sort of just the, um, what Olive talked a bit about is actually being able to visualise what's going on in your low voltage networks and understanding what's actually happening so you can actually run them a bit harder and um, you know, utilise more capacity, accommodate more distributed energy resources sort of thing. Um, you're also looking at the transmission level is where you can get a very low cost way of measuring what's actually going on a transmission circuit, particularly in the span that it causes the constraint or the limitation on how, how much power you can put through the circuit. And that's, that's you know, sort of got some very um, you know, important implications because you can probably get a lot more capacity out of your system by some, you know, very cheaply. Um, yeah, so uh, it's looking at those things and probably one of the key things that will come out, and this may be more C6's um, area in a certain extent, is when you have a whole lot of smart communicating distributed energy resources that are coordinated to work together in some way, what does that mean for how, you know, your loads on the system? And, you know, what opportunities are there to actually coordinate the activity of all these things um, to improve reliability um, and defer um, investment in um, capital? One of the things we talked about at Chengdu <coughs> was um, we had a bit of a discussion around reliability and resilience. Now this is an, um, uh, quite a few working. Uh, quite a few of the um, study committees are actually looking at that and considering what resilience means for them. So reliability is. Um, we had a recent working group um, which there's a considerable Australian and New Zealand input into, which was around the future of reliability, which looked at, you know, how do we have to change our current um, definitions of reliability to accommodate new technologies, more distributed energy resources, um, and so on. So that working group, I'll talk a little bit about that later, um, looked at the sort of the more the reliability edge of things, but reliability is probably more a subset of the overall resilience picture. Most of our power systems were designed to have a reasonable degree or a defined degree of reliability, but that was against commonly occurring events. I mean, when lightning hits your line five times a year and takes it out, for, you know, sort of there's a sort of dis momentary disruption and things go in and out. That's that's sort of one thing. Those are events that happen often enough that you actually are prepared to take um, pretty contingent measures, like imposing constraints in your market, so you limit the amount of power going through here, so the event of you losing a transmission circuit or the other transmission circuits won't be overloaded. So for Frequently occurring events, um, they often manage through things like market constraints or by procuring ancillary services. The resilience is probably more to do with when you get hit by a number of events in succession that is probably a very rare event and doesn't happen maybe years, decades or hundreds or centuries before they actually happen. Um, but it's more looking at um, you know, how, how resilient are you. Now, in New Zealand, for example, um, I guess in light of the Christchurch earthquakes, you know, sort of a lot of the, um, you know, the transmission network was, was reasonably okay after the, um, after the earthquakes. There was sort of no loss of supply. The distribution networks didn't survive so well. Like I said, a lot of their underground cables suffered um, quite a bit. But the idea really is, is that, you know, when you design your resilience, you want to make sure your transmission's almost definitely there as long as there's some distribution left. Um, and, and so on, but if there's, you know, there will be a point where the earthquake or whatever will be so large, there won't be any load after the event, so you don't need to worry about your transmission. <laughs> <laughs> now, understanding those things and 
And that comes into the design, um, for example, of uh, equipment. How do you work out, you know, you design for wind speeds of a certain amount, um, you know, what's your return period for a wind speed of this size, and, you know, and sort of this is how you design the strength of your tower. Now, we've looked at cases in New Zealand where you're sort of building a new spur and you're trying to work out, you know, how resilient should we make this? We've already decided to build the spur, so that's not in question. Now it's working out how much extra money could you spend to make this resilient, more resilient? And in one case, we worked out that for a, a fairly sensitive load, avoiding an, an event that occurred, say, 50 years on average, once every 50 years on average, it was probably worth, a, you know, sort of about 100,000 per um, tower to actually strengthen it. And so as it's looking at it, we've already decided to build the towers. Um, it was more saying, well, you know, is it really worth making them stronger? Um, so you can avoid certain events and ha have the thing a bit more resilient. It's also sort of investing in things to um, sort of improve your restoration time or mitigate the effects. So instead of having to spend three or four weeks without electricity because you know, um, you know, you just don't have the um, capability anymore, is what can you, what small costs or low cost investments can you make in your network to enable you to um, restore power more quickly? So it's not that you try and avoid. You well, you build everything to avoid the event, it's more saying, when this thing does happen once every 200 years on average, we can reduce half the time that the supply will be out, and this is worth a certain amount of expenditure on our network. And, <coughs> oops. It's also looking at um, some of the other aspects, which is how do you actually manage things. And New Zealand, um, one of the key um, I've got one of the key experiences or, um, that sort of um, set a lot of people's um, uh, mental models around this sort of thing would be the um, blackout in Auckland in, I think it was 1998. The, you had four cables fail in quick succession and for quite a while no one could actually come up with a plan what they're going to do about it. And so having a stakeholder plan for when you do encounter one of these things and being able to go out and tell people this is what we're doing is a sort of a key part of actually managing your resiliency. You can't avoid the event necessarily, but you can make sure that you're well prepared for whatever recovery you're going to do, and that will include managing all your stakeholders. Um, some of the stuff that C1's been doing um, recently, the um, TB775, Global Electricity Network. This is a feasibility study. This one's been quite popular. It's so popular that I've got another new working group um, that just been approved that will um, continue on with this one's work. It sort of looked across the whole world and said, look, we've got seasonal differences in demand, we've got um, sort of temporal daily differences in demand, we've got a whole lot of things going on. Can we actually devise a network that will provide some benefits? And so they looked at that and worked out what you'd actually have to build to um, do that. And that was quite interesting because you're ending up some quite long... Um, cables and um, sort, of, sort of interesting connections across Australia and a few other places. Um, so just to work out, they didn't do the sort of economic justification for it, it was more work out what would you actually have to physically do. Um, TB715, that's the future of reliability, and this is one of the really quite a long um, title. Definition of reliability in light of new developments and various devices and services which offer customers and system operators new levels of flexibility. So it's just basically looking at the existing reliability definitions and working out how they might change or have to be changed and there were um, changes made to these. Um, TB670, that was um, the sort of the um, demand forecast um, group. That was a, I, I led that group, that was one of my working groups and it established the um, best practice approaches for developing credible electricity demand and energy forecasts um, for network planning. And the genesis of that group was actually a meeting we had, I think it was with C2, was it, David? Where we actually, uh, C1 and C2 met for one of their annual um, meetings for a day or so and um, had a good discussion over what was interesting and useful. And this was one of the um, things that came out of it and became a working group and ultimately a technical brochure. And there's also some other stuff that's interesting. There's quite a lot of um, interest in um, how we're going to deal with all this, um, uh, you know, sort of um, periodic, um, you know, sort of variable, intermittent generation and how you actually manage that and plan for that. And you've got um, sort of also, you know, what happens when power starts coming out of distribution networks into transmission networks and um, how you're going to manage and design for that in the future. Deliverables. Um, 
the, we published a technical brochure on the global, bills, global electricity network this year. We've got a couple of working groups nearing um, completion um, with a um, uh, completion in probably next year. Uh, one is around the um, ISO 55 standards around uh, implementation and information guidelines for utilities. And the other one is the one working group I'm finishing with authors of our own COVID, uh, which is C138 valuation as a comprehensive approach to uh, asset management in view of emerging developments. And is um, yeah, so the out and that's the um, other one there. This is the new working group that's just been approved um, for looking at um, the global um, network and this looking at things like trading rules, demand response, and, and storage. And one of Secret Australia's long-standing members, Phil Southall, who can't be here today uh, for probably very good reasons, um, I think his son's getting married, um, is around um, this closing the gap and understanding between stakeholders and electricity, um, electrical engineering, energy um, specialists. So this is our, you know, so what C1's are up to you. I'm glad I've sort of... Um, been given the opportunity to give you a brief overview of what we've been doing, what we've been up to, what we've been doing, and uh, thank you for listening. Um, so what I'll get is... Uh